TSL example. And throughout this entire tutorial, we'll be using um, code that exists in this repository. Um, but this repository also contains several examples we won't have time to go over. Um, you can feel free to look at them. The master branch of this repository will always be up to date with our latest stable release. The development branch will be kept up to date with our development, um, our development tree. And for this specific one, we have a branch UAI 18, and you'll want to check that out because um, that's where we'll put some sort of more specifics that have to deal with this, um, with this tutorial lesson, whatever, whatever you call it. Um, oh yeah, sorry. So you can go ahead and this, and you can also just go. Um, hopefully, searching for PSL dash examples should be sufficient as well to get you to the GitHub. So you can go and do that, and uh, for the first getting started, we're going to be working in the simple acquaintances example. Um, as far as examples go, this is our only toy example, um, where kind of all the data is there, and the data is really small. All the other data we have are either real life um, models that we've used in papers, or they have um, like real data that I guess just lives externally, um, or that uh, are more real robust situations. This is really the only toy we have, but it runs real fast, so it's good for showing people. All right, so let me try and get this. Forgive me if my uh, type is going to be a little off. I have to, uh, since I have to, since they have to be different screens so I can do presenter mode, I can't have that up on my screen at the same time. So I'll be going a little blind for some of it, but we'll figure it out. It's fine. Um, oops. So here we go. This is what PSL examples. Um, so I checked it out. Of course, I developed it, so I checked it out a bit earlier. Um, but so before we get started, to run the PSL examples, or actually to run PSL in general, if you're running the command line interface, then you're going to need Java. Seven or eight, either one work, it's fine. Um, to run from the Groovy interface, and this is if you might need a little more um, customizability than just using what the command line has to offer, then you'll also need Maven as well to build your project. Um, if, you're a real, like, if you're a real Java hacker, then technically you don't need Maven, and you can figure it out, but I, I highly recommend using it, because that's how we manage our project. Um, PSL examples also has several helper scripts, and to run those, you should have some sort of POSIX-based system, so like Linux, Mac, um, or Windows subsystem for Linux should work fine. Um, if you're using something like SIGWIN, there might be a couple things you have to do. I've had varying reports on different versions of SIGWIN here and there. Um, but you also need wget or curl involved, installed. Either one will detect either and use the appropriate. So you should have those pretty light on the, um, on the requirements. So, we got this toy problem. Let's go ahead and um, I guess first I'll talk about it and then we'll go and look at what it actually looks like. For this problem, we're trying to predict who knows who. So we have several people and does this person know this other person? And some information we have, we have where people have lived, we have what people like, and we have some instances of already knowing who knows who. So we have some observed instances of this. So let's go ahead and look at it. So I'll go ahead and go into the simple acquaintances, like I said. I'll go into the um, CLI directory. And I'll open up, let's see, I'll go ahead and open up our model first. So this is what the model for this problem looks like. Um, we can kind of see, just like we had in the um, example before, these kind of simple logical first order like rules. And they're fairly straightforward. So the first one we have, if lived P1, person 1, in place L, and lived P2 and L, and P1 and P2 are not the same, then P1 and P2 probably know each other. So in more English, if two people have lived in the same place, there's evidence that they know each other. Pretty straightforward. And for our second rule, let's see, who wants to try to interpret our second rule? You. Yeah. Uh, the more English version is if two people haven't lived in the same area, then they're more likely to not know each other. Exactly. 
So you see this rule? Yeah, so what he said is, if two people have not lived in the same area, then they probably don't know each other. And you can see here, the rule looks pretty similar, except instead of using L, the same variable, for the location that the two people have lived in, we use two different variables, L1 and L2, and we explicitly stated these variables should not be the same. Then, these people probably don't know each other. So you can see, fairly intuitive things like that. Um, what about this rule? This one's easy. You can say this one. Okay, I'm going to call on people. You. What do you think? What do you think for a rule like that? Could we also go with, uh, so I guess, uh, liking? Uh, yeah. If you want people to uh, if they live together and they like each other, or they, if they like each other, they're more likely to know? Not like each other. If they like the same thing, then they, if there's two people and they like the same thing, then there's evidence that they know each other. So I guess one thing to you that tricks you up is I use the same variable L. Probably shouldn't have done that, but it doesn't really matter. Each rule has independent sets of variables. But let's go ahead and look at the data so we can see what that actually means. So let's go ahead and We adjusted our audio a bit. Um, what, what does the carrot 2 indicate at the very end of this line? So that is the squaring potentials okay. that I mentioned before. So you can either leave them the same and use the normal hinge losses, or you can square them and get that this kind of more trade-off-y behavior. Um, and we'll take a look at the rules in a second. Or we'll, we'll go more into the rules again in a sec. So if we open up the data we have here, here I open three files. Um, here is nose, the no, observed nose links. So who knows who? And you see here we just kind of state kind of the discrete situation. These people know each other. And we're going to assume that if people don't know each other, well, we're just not going to include that information yet. So we can just put it in there kind of straight. Ben knows Elena, Ben knows Dania, et cetera, et cetera. And now let's go to these other two files. They kind of all the same things. So here, we are saying, who likes what? So we can see, of course, everyone likes machine learning. Uh, that, that's obvious. But we can also get kind of the, a more soft version of liking things. So for example, J likes skee-ball, 0.8. Maybe that means we're 80% sure J likes skee-ball. We're not 100% sure. Or maybe it could be like they filled out or they did some sort of recommended recommendations and they're like, oh, ski ball, four out of five stars. Something like that. Some sort of indicator to the amount, the extent to which they like something. So we can see that and we can pull that out a lot. Um, Sabina only likes trivia 0.6 um, to 0.6, maybe um, three out of five stars. And if you know, these are actually all Lynx members, past and current. Um, so some people might actually know some of the people we're talking about. Um, Steve really likes sports, 5 out of 5. Ben, I kind of like sports, 4 out of 5. Can I make a comment here that uh, this is a tab-separated file, and that's why machine learning has a space, so that's like one. Uh, I'm just telling that because if you mm. start trying working with things like that, you might get errors. So. Good point. Yeah, this is a tab. Might be a bit early, but yes. Tab-separated file, just so you know. Um, but you can also support, uh, or we support... In the, in the Groovy interface, we support pretty much any file because you can write a custom loader for it. If you're using CLI, then tab separated, comma separated. Um, if it's not tab, you just have to let us know the delimiter. It's pretty simple. But yeah, so it's tab separated, so machine learning is one, um, is one constant here. But so we can have this sort of thing where we specify kind of the degree of truthiness. And then you can see on the other file, the lived file, well, that's not really something that we can have this continuous thing or this continuous relationship with. There could be maybe uncertainty about who has lived where, but for the most part, if someone has lived there, we just put it there. If that's a one. If it, they didn't live somewhere, just don't include it. That will be zero. So we can see here several people lived in several different locations. Um, nothing too strange there. Any questions about what this data looks like or anything there? 
So we can see that's what the data looks like. And if we go back to the rules, that kind of uh, that kind of helps us interpret these rules a little bit. So like the like one, like you said, it's not liking um, people, it's liking things. So like if Jay likes skee-ball and Steve also likes skee-ball, well, then there's a chance they know each other. If they have common interests, common hobbies, maybe they're in similar communities, something like that. And also note that these rules are allowed to be violated. It's okay if two people have the same interests but don't know each other. It's not like the hard logic like we were saying before. It's just contributing evidence to something. So we use these to kind of build up the evidence we have to give some sort of random variable some value, either high or low. So we have something like this. Um, down here we have a rule that looks slightly different. It doesn't have a weight and it ends in a period. So what this means is that this is a hard constraint. Unlike the other ones, we force these to be, um, these force these ones to be satisfied. We can't violate these ones. And here what we do is we're actually just enforcing a symmetric relationship in our nodes. So we're saying if J and Steve know each other, Steve and J know each other. That's a pretty, like, for knowing people, that's a fairly safe bet to make. Um, note that in something like friendship, that's not safe. Friendship is not necessarily symmetric. If Alice and Bob are friends, Bob and Alice are not necessarily, or Bob is not necessarily friendly with Alice. You had a question? Sure, so the question here was, is that why there's no weight? And yeah, that's true. There is no weight because this is a hard constraint. It, we always try and satisfy it, period. Um, now, it is possible to get into situations where it's just impossible to, if you have too many constraints, where it's impossible to satisfy all your constraints. But still, we don't weight our constraints. We just try and satisfy them all. Um, and if we have an infeasible program, then we'll let you know, but we'll still try and solve it to the best of our ability. And down here you see this rule also looks slightly different than the other ones. There's no arrow. It's not an implication. Here we have a negative prior. So, of course, it's really common in, your, um, in a lot of your models to, have some, to start with some sort of um, prior information, often some sort of negative one, especially in our situations. So we're going to assume, by default, two people don't know each other. So we're going to start with that kind of baseline prior and to not be negative, we have to overcome that with evidence from our other rules. So that's really common to start with this negative prior. Let's see. So you got something like this. Any questions about some of the syntax here? Uh, you'll be seeing many rules today. Uh, we're wondering about the weights. So is sure. Guidelines or how do you go about setting the weights? Sure. So once again, a good question. So the question here was, how do you set the weights? Or are there any guidelines with setting weights? So there are... Like, the first thing to understand the weights, and like you said, or like uh, I said before, is that the weights are relative to all the different rules. So there's no really absolute value that matters. There's no one, like, sweet spot that you're going to hit that will, that's the perfect um, weight for a specific rule. It all, everything matters in context. What your data looks like, what other rules you have in play, things like that. And usually it's nice to come in with some, um, some sort of domain knowledge about it be like, I feel that intuitively this rule should be this much more important than this rule. And you can set them up like that. But we also have the ability to learn weights in PSL, to give it some sort of truth data, and we will go and try and discover the best assignments of weights. Or, the, yeah, the best assignments of weights to kind of maximize the likelihood or maximize some sort of other metric um, of the program. And weight learning is a very active... Um, like a very active area of research for it. So we're often coming up with new weight learning methods um, and improvements to that. So how sensitive those weights are? Like is it a five compared to three? Or maybe like ten? How sensitive? In that one, it really depends on the data and the other rules in play. So I can't really say specifically that, um, that our rules are this amount sensitive. It really depends on the program and like every, all the exact rules in play. Um, Uh, like once again, it depends how all the other rules and weights are situated. Like if someone did a nine out of a ten, but all your other rules are also at like 
uh, like nine, like ten point one, nine point nine, things like that. Then of course it'll have a larger effect. But if in something like this, where we kind of have a rule separated by a minimum of five, um, like kind of a kind of a ten percent jump in the weight of a rule probably won't have the greatest effect. Um, but once again, I can't say unless or I can't say without actually running the program, knowing all the data in here. Because it also matters like how many instances of that rule get grounded, how many instances exist. And without knowing that, we can't really answer any specifics about how sensitive um, the weight for a specific rule is. And you could run it through for a small example. Just It's a term in the equation. Yeah. So, I mean, you could work a small example and go look at it. Mm -hmm. And we'll run a little bit of weight learning a little bit later. But for the most part in this tutorial, um, we're not going to be running too much weight learning. And mainly for time constraints. Like weight learning doesn't take overly amount of time. Like generally it's an iterative process and generally we'll run anywhere between 15 and 25 iterations. So it takes about 15 to 25 times longer than normal program. And you'll see normal program runs fairly quickly, usually under a minute. So the time constraints for weight learning are not great, but at the same time we don't really have time to run it in this tutorial setting. Cool. Let's Go back to my notes so I don't get too too far off track. Um, How is it in terms of time? Is this during the first uh, part or the second? Second part. Okay. So, what a PSL example looks like. Actually, I'll just stay on this because it's easier. Um, but all you'll see all PSL examples have the same basic structure. So it's a very common thing. You can jump from one example to the other without too much trouble. But you see, we're gonna have a readme, and the readme is gonna talk about where the data came from, what kind of problem we're working with, some any details in the model, like has this model been published in any papers, things like that. Um, and then also give you some keywords on describing the model. Does it do weight learning? Is it real data? Is it synthetic data? Things like that. So then we'll have the CLI directory, and inside every um, directory there's going to be a run script that you can just use to run the model straight up. And that's what we'll be utilizing very heavily during this um, during this session because it's very easy to run it and it lets you configure like it has places to easily configure how you want to run it things like that. And then you're just going to have some sort of data file that describes what your data is going to look like, and we'll look at that file in a moment. And then it's going to have some sort of model file with the extension usually PSL, and that will have the rules in it. And that's about it for the CLI. Um, the run script will automatically go and fetch any data that um, any data that needs to exist if it doesn't if it's not already there. Um, we'll see examples also have the data directory where that data will live, and then it's also going to have a Groovy directory where a Groovy version of the example is also implemented. Like I said before, we have two major interfaces: we have the command line interface, the CLI, and then we have a Groovy version. Groovy essentially being Java. You can just write Java if you want it, and it's the same thing. Um, yeah, and then the Groovy one, we have the Palm file for Maven, and then once again, a run script and the actual code itself. So you're going to have something like that. And so the CLI, like I said, it's, you're going to have to require two files, the model file and the data file. So we already kind of looked at the rules in the model. Let's go ahead and look at the, what the data file looks like real quick. So the data file is going to look like something like this. Um, if, you, if you're on your data format, you should recognize this as YAML, because it is. Um, and then it's going to have it's going to be separated into four different chunks, but really two kind of different sections. The first one up here is the predicates, and there we're going to define what predicates you're allowed to use in your rules. So first we're going to give the name of it, and then we're going to give the arity or how many arguments it can take, and then we're going to say whether or not it's open or closed. So the idea of open or closed predicates is pretty important in PSL. A closed predicate is one that only has observed data associated with it. We're not trying to infer any values for any predicate associated with a closed predicate. Um, so there are always there's always observed values inside of our program and our optimization. We can treat them as constants. And um, note that with closed predicates, we apply a closed world assumption to them. So any value that we do not explicitly observe, but that might come up. Um, in the PSL program, we're just going to treat it as zero. So if you don't put anything in there, we just treat it as zero and we move on. Then we have open predicates, and open predicates are just ones that we that may have values that we 
we want to assume that may have random variables, that may have kind of configurations or values that we want to assign a truth value to. Um, and one thing to note here, here in this example, knows is our open predicate. But at the same time, we are also going to observe some nose relationships. And that kind of brings us into this second part of this data file, or this chunk right here, observations. So here we're going to load in all the observed data that we want. Everything that we want to treat as constants, treat as true. So besides loading the lib and the likes, like kind of the ones, the closed predicates that we have the data for, we want to also load some nose relationships that we've already observed. Um, even though nose is an open predicate, we actually call it a partially observed because we do observe some data for it. And the data in the in the uh, uh, sorry in the observations partition or the observations section, we're going to label that as constants. We're not going to try to assign values to it. We're going to take those as truth. And then the next two section targets and truth. So targets is what you want to infer values for. Everything in there is something that you want PSL to do inference over and assign a value to, and then you have truth. So truth, just the ground truth, hopefully matching up one-to-one -one with the targets. And in that section, um, then the truth is really only necessary if you want to do either weight learning or evaluation on it. But if you do, then PSL, you can do weight learning or PSL has some built-in evaluation tools you can utilize. Question? So for the likes and the lib, right, you said all the observations are given to you. Yep. Uh, what would happen if you Sure. So the question here was, what happens if you made likes and lived open? So if we made likes and lived open, then we would just start inferring values for it. Now, if we did it kind of off the cuff right now without changing our data at all, then PSL would encounter an issue because it would say likes and lived are open, but I see all these liked and lived um, ground atoms, these kind of configuration of constants that I want to assign a value for, but you didn't tell me that it's a target. So by default, PSL would, would raise an exception and say, hey, you have some sort of weird thing with your data where you have a target you didn't tell me about. So it'll, by default, it'll give you an exception, but you can also run in lazy mode, which we'll see later. Galoosh will show you some examples of lazy inference later. And what PSL will do instead of, um, instead of throwing an exception, it'll say, okay, I see a target you didn't tell me about, but I'm going to assume that's okay, and I will construct that target myself if I need it. Um, so yeah, I guess short answer, by default, it'll throw, your data is probably not being configured for it, so it'll throw the exception, but you can also just turn on lazy inference, and then it'll start to build those targets as it encounters them. All right. So we get that. I think we're about ready to run. So we're about ready to run the example. Like I said, you can just run the run script. That's the easiest thing to do. Um, if for some reason you can't, well, we can, uh, like it's not too hard to run it from the command line, but this is nice because it builds the options. So you can kind of just go into the script and um, look at the options itself. And we'll do that in a moment, but first let's actually get something running. So you just run it, and there we go. PSL ran it and inferred all the targets. You can see pretty quick, less than a second. Um, and then you have some little info here on the process. Of course, you can change the logging level to get more or less information. Um, but you can see right here, it loaded up all the data, completed um, optimization in about four, or in exactly 405 iterations. And then in this example, we also have it set up to do evaluation so that you can kind of see the quality of the results. Now, it's just a toy example, so evaluation doesn't really matter that much. But at least you can see how it runs. So let's go into the run script. So you can kind of see the different things in play here. So in our run scripts, up at the top, we define what our version is going to be. If you want to use a different version of PSL, you can just change that, and it'll go and fetch the appropriate jar file that you need. Um, and then here in our um, run script, oh, oh question. question. Sorry, uh, Eric, in this example, did, did you just use the, uh, uh, sorry, over your, your nomenclature, the truth data. The truth data was just used for the eval. You didn't do weight work. Correct. Okay. The truth value was just used for evaluation. We didn't do weight learning. Okay. But before I finish this kind of getting started section, I'll show you an example of weight learning. So here we have some general kind of slugs where you can put um, whatever options you want. Um, and here we, um, 
for either just kind of general PSL or if you want some evaluation options. The really only reason there are two here is when you run weight learning, that's a different invocation of the CLI. So you'll want to carry over these between this option between both weight learning and kind of evaluation. But you see it's pretty straightforward. We already have the data, and this is actually invoking it. Most of this is just the, uh, the options we have here. So it's just like Java jar, and we get the model, we get the model file, we get the data file, we tell it where we want to output the data. Nothing too fancy. Um, invoking, like invoking it is pretty straightforward. You can also, if you ever, um, if you ever need help on what to do, there's a usage. Can't really see it on the screen, font's a little too big, but there's a decent usage that you can go and uh, see how you use PSL. Oh, that didn't help at all. Well, well, you can just go look at the usage. And there is a lot of ways that you can also configure PSL, um, particularly on the command line, to do different things however you want it. So let's go ahead and kind of just look at a couple of these options, or a couple of these examples. So for example, let's say we wanted to um, let's say we wanted to get more logging. So we can do we have log for j logging backend dot threshold. Oops. And we'll, let's say we want to debug logging. Oops. Let me know if you see any typos because I gotta go type in blind a lot of this. So let's say we wanted to get more output. I particularly like the debug logging a lot because I get to see how many groundings there are per rule. And I'm very interested in the performance of it. I really like that. Let's see. Oh, man. Oh, good. I found it. There we go. So you can see we have a significantly more data output from here. Uh, I'll get your question one second. My favorite thing is you can get the groundings per rule. Here we go. So you can see for each rule how many instances it actually grounds, how many ground rules are kind of those potential functions you're really dealing with. And when debugging this is a good thing to have because you can see if you have zero ground rules. That's a very common problem that people have, usually because they have some sort of weird thing in their data. Um, I've seen lots of people like they actually include like a space at like the end of their file or something and then it makes the constant different and they have zero ground rules or they have some weird thing with the rules where it's actually impossible for it to ground anything. Things like that. You had a question? So the, the result in the input predicates directory yep. has the things that you asked for and uh, what seems like probability, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what seems like a probability? Um, so whether or not that's your question, I'm going to stop you real quick so we can talk about that. So what he's talking about is this model by default, or all the examples by default, throws things out in the inferred predicates directory. And if you're inferring one predicate, well, there's only one file in there. But if you're inferring multiple ones, it'll dump all the data out in there. And here we see kind of the two constants of the nose predicate. So nose, J, and Alex. And it gives a number there. And uh, um, whether or not this might have been your question, I might have preempted it, was this looks like a probability. And it's really important in PSL to understand that that is not a probability. You shouldn't treat that, you can't, like if you want to treat that as say a rounding probability or something, then you can do that. And technically if you treat that as a rounding probability, then you have a three-fourths guarantee that you're solving max sat. Um, like there's some theoretical, some theoretical things behind that. But in general, you shouldn't treat this as a probability. Treat it as something a little different. We call it, we try and call it a truth value or something like that. Um, it's some sort of value between 0 and 1 that has some sort of, that, and give, the value it has here is some sort of maximal assignment, like the best it can be. The, be, the value that makes the MRF as satisfied as possible. And what, yeah, so you really, you really should interpret it as a probability. And 
one thing you can do instead of using it as a probability, it's very useful to say using it as a, maybe a ranking thing. As to say, this one has a higher value than this other one. Even though, and that doesn't mean it's more probable than it, it just means it has a higher value. The world is more satisfied with this having a high value. If I wanted to ask a uh, more complex predicate, for mm -hmm. example, if I wanted to say Ben and Steve and Elena and Jim, right? Of, yep. both, of both those pairs being no in, in a no relationship, could I specify that and get a number for that? And could I could I also rank that with respect to the remaining ones? Sure. So the question there was if you had so actually like I gotta clarify, was it if you had a predicate that had the three people? Like no, 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 no three no, no. There, or Mm -hmm. of, of them being true together, right? Of them being true together. Well, you can't... So you, we don't... In PSL, we don't answer that question. Um, and it's not really them being true together. It's... I, I guess what you're kind of looking for is the value... Is, is, Can I take the product? Yeah. That's the no, no, no. It's, it's more than just the product, right? I mean, it's... Uh, if you, first of all, if it's not a problem, they're going to take it wrong. Even if it's yeah. the right ID, right? It's more than that, it's a joint, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the product. I want to know the joint test distribution of those two things being true, right? Well, I think... Uh, can I say something? Go for it, Goldness. So, uh, Speak loud. Uh, <laughs> so the true challenge is... You have but to it's not something that PSL actually supports at the moment. Uh, but it's good answer. Question way in the back. No, it's not a question. Oh. You can always try to model it by introducing a new rule, right? You can have an equivalent mm -hmm. say, give me, let's call it what is it, Siri now, two, equivalent to, and then you say whatever you're interested in the conjunctive part in there. So that way you can get an answer in terms of this PSL approximation in the underlying um, distribution. So, yeah, so, sure. so if, that, if that's the case, then uh, could I still be confident that the ranking will be correct? Because now I have I have questions of different types, right? I have, I, I have like univariate questions like these, and I have... Yeah, but, but that's why he was a little struggling to, like he was giving you the intuition that you can do it as a ranking, but he was not saying there's a valid ranking no matter what. Well, then what's the use of it then? <laughs> if it's not you should then take that one out and say that is on a different, like, I, I'm not sure whether you want to call it type or whatever, because it's a higher order, uh, higher order argument than you're talking to me. Thanks. Sure. Cool. Um, oh, another question. Yeah, so the question there was another way to possibly model this would be to take the, um, what do you say, like the pairwise relationships? Yeah, to take a pairwise representation between all the people and use that as features and say logistic regression and whether or not we get the same answers here. And um, my answer to that is we haven't done that for this example. Um, I believe we have done it for things in the past to take that pairwise relationship, but even then, you are still not, like, it's still not exact, it's still not the same problem. Um, because kind of, if we think back to the initial example when I was talking about predicting uh, the weather in multiple cities at the same time, with those pairwise relationships, those have to be a feature set in stone. It has to be a constant that you then feed into your logistic progression. 
Whereas in something more relational, say like PSL, we are inferring the relationships between all the peoples jointly. So we're inferring them all together, and it doesn't have to be some sort of constant. Um, so the short answer is, we haven't done it for the example. The long answer is, it's not exactly the same problem, um, but it's still definitely something that's interesting to look at. Um, so, sorry, I'm not sure what uh, the, the model you were proposing for kind of the kind of flat statistical method. Um, could, could you elaborate that? I think maybe you were trying to elaborate that as well. So I guess one of the things, so the big thing you're talking about there is kind of like both ease of use and bringing it up in like a higher level thing. So instead of constructing the model or the features by hand, you can use this higher level representation to build your models. And that is definitely true. And in addition to that, I still think um, like there may be, I still think there's a little more to that or another kind of dimension on that in the joint inference um, and kind of how it does joint inference. Like it's not, like in the flat model, no matter what, once you put something in a feature vector, it's a constant. You can't change it anymore. Whereas in this collective model, we can infer, we can infer multiple things at the same time. So we can infer in the weather example, we can infer the weather in both San Jose and Santa Cruz at the same time. Whereas if that was in a feature vector that we we're passing to say logistic regression, then we would have to compute that pairwise relation ahead of time, and it has to have a fixed value to put into logistic regression. Does, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, that's probably just one of my questions about it. What is the, how different is the outcome gap to just the same investigation across the Right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to try and blast. Oh, wait. Five minutes until break. Yeah, five minutes. So I'm just trying to blast through this. Do you mind if I hold your question until later? Okay. So I'm just trying to blast through this, not too much. Um, so like I said, if you want to configure, say, oops. If you want to configure, got it this time. If you want to configure something like a, like the logging level, you can pass an option like this. You can also go into like the deep internals of PSL, and there's tons of um, options that you can there, like. Uh, User dot iterations. Let's try and set the max iterations to five. Hopefully, I typed it right. Uh, or, or roll the dice. See if I did. Um, but there's tons of options all over the place that you can go deep into, deep 
internally and try and set different things. Tune different factors of the optimization. Tune step size. Turn the number of iterations in ADMM. Tune some sort of like penalties or hyperparameters here and there. There's a lot you can tune in PSL, even from the command line or in Groovy. So you can see right here, ADMM reasoner optimization completed in five um, iterations. Even the, like, we were able to successfully um, kind of change how our optimization engine works on the command line, just passing these options. Um, if you need, there are um, there are links on our in our um, on the website to kind of all the different configuration options you can do. There's quite a few. Um, I guess going real quick, the real important things to also know about is that you can also use uh, switch out your database backend you're using. By default, um, PSL will use the H2 database engine. That's an embedded Java um, database engine. It works nice because it's really um, it's really portable. It works pretty much anywhere. It's just Java, um, but it's not like super scalable. So if your program, say, as a rule of thumb, we say if you're grounding more than a million ground rules, then you should consider using a different database backend. And one of the database backends we support is Postgres. And to use it, it's pretty simple. You can just on the command line, you can just tell it you're using Postgres. Right here, dash s Postgres. And you can put the database name, and then there's other more configuration things you want to do if you have more complex connection issues. Um, but we can see we can run like that, and it ran slightly faster, but we didn't really ground any ground rules, so it doesn't really matter. Um, under a second, still under a second. But yeah, so you can switch back in like that, and we'll see that um, in play a little bit more later. Um, lazy inference, I'll skip that, but we'll talk a little more in detail about that. Um, only real other thing is weight learning. So I'm going to go ahead and back out into another example real quick, citation categories. Uh, I'm just going to use this because by default it does um, weight learning. Actually, to try and make it just a little, a little faster, I'm going to try to I'll run on Postgres. Um, you can see here the run script for one that for a example that does weight learning. It looks fairly simple. There are looks fairly similar. There's one other option here, additional learn options. Um, instead of just writing evaluation down here, it also does weight learning first. Nothing too fancy. Um, so we can just run it real quick. And PSL provides several different methods to do weight learning. You can look at uh, you can look through the um, the documentation online. They'll discuss a little bit here and there the different options you can use. Um, and we don't really have time to go into all the specifics. We can do a whole other tutorial just about weight learning. Um, but you see it ran weight learning and up there. And you see it running, now it's going to run the inference on the um, weights it learned. And we can open up real quick. Station categories. We can look at the, the weights it learned. There we go. And you see here it learned pretty similar to one weights. It says, uh, let these all be approximately equal, which kind of makes sense in this, in this specific example, but we don't really have time to go over the model. Can I ask a question? Yes. You had some weights that they were 5 or 10. Yeah. Uh, is it possible? So when you do weight learning, do you learn all the weights, or you can say, well, this is going to be 0.5? Currently, our methods do learn all the weights. Um, but that may, that may change. Like I said, we're we're looking at a lot of different, like weight learning for us is a very active field of development. The reason why I'm asking is because right now when you learn them, they're between zero and one, but when you define them, you define oh, some type. Oh, no, 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 it doesn't necessarily learn between zero and one. Oh, it just okay. happened to put those values there. Does it learn negative weights too? So currently we don't learn negative weights in our stable releases, but in our development releases, we do have the ability to learn negative weights. And the reason we don't exactly do, or the reason kind of it's not, we don't like to support in our master branch, at least not right now, is because when we negate some of these rules, they become non-convex. Um, so you can't, so in some situations, you can't learn the negative weight. Um, but instead, what we do is we can, for certain situations, we can take that rule we have, and instead of negating that weight, we can substitute three different logical rules that solve the same potential as that one. Um, I guess it's not necessarily three. It's actually the number of atoms um, squared minus one. Mm -hmm. 
So it can potentially blow up the number of ground rules you have if you have really complex rules. But because of these complexities, we are currently leaving that, those out of our um, stable branch. And instead, it'll just bring it down to zero, um, the weight for the rule. It'll just say, oh, you should just be zero. We'll leave you there. Is this semantic of a, uh, of a negative weight uh, that it's, it means a negation, or that's not necessarily the? So it's not necessarily a semantic. Actually, let's say yes. Um, like, there's pretty like deep interpretations of what a negative weight means, and you can semantically interpret it as this rule has a, like a negative correlation instead of a positive one. And say so, like since it has a negative correlation, you want to replace it with a substitute set of rules that capture that negative correlation. But of course, in like logical rules, when you negate it, it doesn't necessarily just mean like when you get, negate a complex rule, you can't just say it's the opposite of that, and you can't necessarily capture that one rule. Okay, so I think it's time for a break. Let's thank uh, Eric. <laughs> we'll have a twenty-minute uh, break, and then we'll come back, continue with uh, Gagnus. Great. Thanks, everyone.